Welcome. And thank you for joining us for Shakespeare and Possibility. My name is Jennifer Burkett, and I am the 2023 to 2024 postdoctoral research fellow at Shakespeare at Notre Dame. I hope that you'll find your experience with Shakespeare and Possibility to be insightful and engaging as we discuss the future, the past, and the present of Shakespeare here at Notre Dame. We also hope that you'll stay connected not only to us here at Shakespeare at Notre Dame, but to the global learning community on and at this time, we want to thank our sponsors, the Shakespeare at Notre Dame program and the Notre Dame Alumni Association. This week, I am delighted that we have the opportunity to discuss the Shakespeare in Prisons Network an initiative which seeks to bring Shakespeare to incarcerated populations worldwide through classwork, education, and performance. Joining me today are the founders of the Shakespeare in Prisons Network, Scott Jackson, the Mary Irene Ryan Family Executive Director at Shakespeare at Notre Dame, Professor Peter Holland, the McNeil Family Chair in Shakespeare Studies at the University of Notre Dame, and Kurt Tuckland, the founder and producing director of Shakespeare Behind Bars, one of the longest-running, continuously operating prison theater programs in the United States. Thank so thank you to all of you for being with us. So let's begin by pointing out that it's been a little over 10 years since the three of you founded the Shakespeare in Prisons Network with the goal of using the arts, specifically Shakespeare performance, to lower rates of recidivism and help returning citizens re-enter our communities. So why don't we begin by just having you all tell us a little bit about how the network began and why the University of Notre Dame became its flagship. Well, I suppose it starts with me. I better begin it. I came to Notre Dame in 2002 as the first holder of the McNeil Family Chair in Shakespeare Studies. And it seemed to me to be right that we should celebrate that brand new chair as far as I know, the only Shakespeare chair in the world that is not in an English or literature department, its home at Notre Dame is the Department of Film, Television and Theatre, we should celebrate that chair by having a conference. And so I devised a conference on Shakespeare memory and performance. And amongst the people who came along to listen was Kurt Toftelund. And we fell into conversation. Neither of us knew each other. We knew a little bit of each other. And we discovered that we had a common interest. And really, I think it started from there. But that was just before Scott came to Notre Dame. But by the time Scott arrived, we were already getting interested in what could we make happen. Kurt, how did, is that a reasonable summary of how it all began? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So the next step, I and started Scott, what was the next step? Shakespeare at Notre Dame in 2007. And it wasn't too long after that, I started to hear about this conversation that Peter and Kurt had a few years prior to that. And we really started to meet and talk about why a Shakespeare in Prison conference would be a good thing, as well as why Notre Dame seemed the, the perfect home for such a conference and such a network. And so over the ensuing years, we're talking about 2010, I think, to 2011, we really started to plan what does this look like and who might we invite to it? And that brought us all the way to the first conference in November of 2013, where I guess I'll just leave it at the fact that we expected maybe 25 or 30 prison theater practitioners to join us. And I had to cut off registration at 63 because it was blowing our budget out of the water. The response was incredible and exceedingly international, bringing a lot of siloed projects together because the practice of prison theater is very solitary in nature. It's siloed by its very nature. So to bring all of these different practitioners, researchers, academics into the same room to discuss questions that, that, that were germane to producing theater in prison, to teaching theater and specifically Shakespeare in prison together was something I could never anticipate I don't know about you two, what your response was to that first conference, but I will say that some of the first words said on that stage, Peter took the stage at that first Shakespeare in prisons conference and said, 
maybe not in these words, I declare the first Shakespeare Prisons Conference has commenced. And the first order of business is to announce that we will produce this biennially, that this will be a, a conference that we bring together, bring you all together every two years. You remember that moment, Peter? Yeah, I do. And let's think back to what, what preceded that moment, because it was a characteristic Notre Dame journey to get to that moment. Scott and Kurt and I developed a, an idea of something we wanted to make happen. And the crucial thing and the reasoning behind it is that so many of those people knew of each other, but didn't ever have the chance to spend time all together. There were no venues of which those people who would do this extraordinary work within prisons could actually talk to each other. There were email conversations going on, but not an in-person conference. And we all know that at the great conferences, it's not just what happens on the stage, as it were. It's all those conversations that take place all around it. So we wanted to bring people together. And Scott and I developed a little proposal, and we started showing it to people at Notre Dame. And every single person we spoke to said, this is wonderful. This is what Notre Dame is about. This is about the Catholic social justice tradition. It is central to what the mission of Notre Dame is. And how can we help you make it happen? And I think that speaks of why Notre Dame. Why? Because everybody got it immediately. No, not one single person said, I, I'm sorry, you have to explain to me why this is worth doing. Everybody just instantly saw that enabling and facilitating in this way, even though at that time, Notre Dame didn't have a strong tradition of working in prisons, unlike now, when so many faculty are involved in educational process, programs within the prison system. But people could see it had to do with Catholic teaching and why it mattered. And I think one of the reasons I, we should say why we needed a rather large budget, and we did, was because the people we wanted to make sure could come couldn't afford flights, couldn't afford hotel accommodation. So we had to cover the kinds of costs which in a normal academic conference would be covered by the individual participants. But we had to say, no, we can't do it that way around. We've got to make it possible for people who do this work out of passion and love and concern and belief and faith that they could come to the conference without thinking, oh my gosh, that it's that or the family budget is blown. That, that was essential. And we did it quickly because everybody was so excited at Notre Dame about this possibility. There's something quintessentially Notre Dame in it. I think that's wonderful. I'm curious, since that first conference, there's been four conferences, Shakespeare in Prison conferences, and one currently in the works, I believe, for 2025, after a short little hiatus with COVID. And I'd be curious if the three of you could talk about maybe a highlight or a specific moment from one of these conferences that has stayed with you over the years. Go on, Kurt. You pick your favorite moment. <laughs> well, I, I want to back up one little step before I, I jump into that. And that's the kind of the connecting link. And that is I was in the Netherlands at a conference screening the Shakespeare Behind Bars documentary and giving a keynote. And at that same conference was another prison artist that I knew, Tom McGill from Northern Ireland, who had made a film called Mickey B. And he was screening the film and giving a keynote. So we, of course, met knew of each other, but had never met in person and became instantly bonded. And at the end of that conference, I said, I'm going to see if I can get you to the United States. And he said, I'm going to see if I can get you to Northern Ireland. I said, yeah, I'll probably be able to do it before you. And he said, yeah, of course. And so when I got back to the States, I immediately called Peter and I, cause I knew Peter would know Tom McGill's film, Mickey B. And, and I told him that I'd met him and I asked him what the possibility was for Notre Dame to pay his transportation over to the States. And he and I were going to go on a tour, a screening tour of both documentaries. And of course, uh, one of the stops would be Notre Dame. Peter said, let me get back to you and immediately came back and said, yeah, we will fund his travel, which is the, really the most expensive piece of the little puzzle. And, and then Tom would speak at Notre Dame. And then that really, I think, turned up the temperature for talking about a, a national 
slash international conference for the Shakespeare in prison. So it was another teaching artist, prison teaching artist, that was the impetus for it to kick it off the ground. Because we'd been talking about it for a number of years. Yeah. And this was it. This was the moment that. So we didn't have a long period of time to, to plan it. And that's why I think we thought that we'd probably have 25, 30 people that might show up. And as Scott told you, we had to cut off registrations. Jumping to your next question, what are, what are the most, what is a memorable moment? The difficulty with that is, is they're all memorable moments. One of the reasons that I've worked in prisons for almost 30 years now is because I get to bear witness to miracles of transformation, miracles of change. And that includes myself as a, te as a facilitator, but also in the individuals that sit in the circle with us. And that's what, really what my addiction is, that miraculous uh, thing that can happen where a light bulb goes on and all of a sudden a human being sees themselves in the world and the world in a very different way. So all of the moments that have happened, whether it was teaching artists that came to share their work or bear witness, or whether it was returning citizens that came, because we've tried to include returning citizens in, in, in all aspects of the, the conferences, because they're really, as my warden at Luther Luckett said about the prisoners that he was supervising, he said, they're our product. And whether or not we're successful is based on that product. It's not based on us. And the moment that a prisoner comes into prison, we have to be preparing them for, to leave prison. And the real story begins after the prisoners leave and come back to come back home. And then the real, as I characterize it and the return citizens that I work with, the real work begins and that's staying out of prison because of all of the odds that are stacked against them. About 67% of prisoners coming out go back to prison within three years and over 75% go back within five years. It, it isn't just a matter of getting out and everything is hunky-dory. It's a, the struggle continues. So we've focused on returning citizens being able to share their story with other returning citizens and, 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 uh, our recidivism rate for Shakespeare behind bars over almost 30 years now is 6%, which it is, it is a stat that's, it, it is astonishing. And it's all them. It has nothing yes. to do with me. I simply create the space for them to come and sit. And uh, it's them because the burden is on them to change their thinking and change their behavior in prison and then to carry that outside the prison walls. So I think that one of the things that we're talking about just as a little preview about Shakespeare in Prison 5, is really focusing on the return citizen piece of it because I have now over 300 prisoners that are back home. And all of the programs that have come since our first Shakespeare in Prison conference have recidivism rates that are lower and also have return citizens. And it, it's an ongoing battle to stay out of prison because the re-entry programs, although improving, are still not what they need to be to help the guys stay out. Kurt, there's a couple of things I think we might need to explain to people who've been listening to this. The first is that, that there, there are two films we've now mentioned, very different kinds of films. There's the documentary, Shakespeare Behind Bars, about your work in Luther Luckett in Kentucky. And the kind of work that you do there, and I'll come back to that in a moment. That's the second thing I really wanted to clarify for people. But the other film, Mickey B, that you mentioned, that Tom McGill made in Belfast, was filmed in Mahaberry Prison in, in Belfast, a prison that is segregated by faith. Different blocks are Catholic or Protestant because it's seen as not being safe to let the prisoners be together. And yet, Tom's film, which is a version of Macbeth, of Shakespeare's Macbeth, radically adapted and thought through, he managed to bring both sides together in that experience. And that in itself was such a remarkable achievement. But I think one of the other things about your work, and please correct me if I get any of this wrong, the people who are on the Shakespeare Behind Bars program 
choose a play, they cast it, you go in and direct it. And in case anybody listening thinks, oh, what <laughs> kinds of prisoners are these? Are these people who have an extra parking violation in for a few days or whatever, or a month or two? These are long-term prisoners who have committed horrible crimes that neither they nor we in any, at any moment seek to minimize. They are murderers and rapists and people who have done the worst of things. But as I've heard so often from returning citizens, from people who have finished their sentence, who are out on parole, who are back in the community, I am not only the worst thing I've ever done. It doesn't mean they ever deny what they did. These are not people who say, I'm not guilty. I should not be here. I don't belong here. These are people who accept their crime, take on that responsibility, and that's the basis for their transformation. Until you see yourself, you can't change. Until you are clear about what it is that you have committed and how that has harmed so many different people, not just the victim, as it were, but all the collateral damage, all those people who make up the families and friends and others who are harmed by that. And all of that has to be faced up to. And there are moments in that documentary, Shakespeare Behind Bars, about your work, Kurt, where people are talking to camera about what they did. And it's a remarkable moment of, if you like, confession, of uh, open acknowledgement to a public they will never see. I have a favorite moment. And it was on the eve of the second Shakespeare in Prisons conference. So just the evening before we convened, we were having dinner right there, what is now right there in Eddy Street Commons, all of us at a big table, Tom McGill being there, Kurt, you being there, Peter, I'm, I'm trying to remember if you <laughs> were there too, but we all look up and in walk Sammy and Barbara Byron. And Sammy features heavily in the Shakespeare Behind Bars documentary. And I believe had been inside for, at that point, 25 years. Is that right, Kurt? 25? Uh, he, he was in for the crime. 31. Uh, life sentence with 31 parole. Years. And he served He'd 31 of Heard that life sentence. worked with him many times in many productions. This was the first moment that they encountered each other outside of the razor wire. And so we were treated to the first embrace of Sammy and Kurt. Sammy is a free man. And I can't even really talk about it without getting a little bit emotional just because it was such a powerful moment. And it goes right to what Peter was saying. So many of the most special moments of these conferences and of this network have been outside of formal activities. It's not what someone said on stage. It was about the conversation you had while having coffee or at dinner or getting to know someone and hearing their stories and forging these lifelong bonds and just finding our tribe together. So that's the one that really sticks out for me more than there's hundreds I could talk about, but that one really just comes front of mind when I think about it. We should say that the second conference connected with the annual meeting of the Shakespeare Theatre Association, which is an organization that Kurt helped to found, it was one of the founders of the Shakespeare, then the Shakespeare Theatre Association of America. <laughs> it's the organization that brings together those Shakespeare theaters that are coast to coast across the states and everywhere across the world, companies devoted to the work of Shakespeare. And because, of course, we were at Notre Dame and it was at the beginning of an anniversary year for Shakespeare, the, the big year of 2016, when we marked the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. And of course, I had to explain to them, the delegates of the conference and the delegates, of course, to the Shakespeare in Prisons conference, about the most important Shakespeare in terms of Notre Dame history, not William Shakespeare, but Bill Shakespeare, the quarterback in the famous 1935 Ohio State game who came on near the end of the game and won the game for Notre Dame and the first game to be dubbed the game of the century. And there is a scrap of newsreel film of that great game. 
that I could show them and introduce them to. That really was a special blending of those two different cohorts. And we were able to bring these approaches to Shakespeare that are outside of a traditional audience actor encounter with Shakespeare and performance and bring it into more of what is Shakespeare, and this goes right with the theme of what it is we're doing here, the possibilities surrounding Shakespeare. As we look forward into the 21st century, we look beyond the stage. Where is Shakespeare having impact in community settings? How is Shakespeare giving voice to populations that have been historically excluded from the study and performance of his works? And that was a moment where we were able to just say, Shakespeare in prisons practitioners meet the Shakespeare Theater Association producers and vice versa. And we could frame the content of the conference around Shakespeare being this vehicle for positive social change. That was a special moment. That was January of 2016. Amazing. We we even had the first folio here. It was. And that's right. Mm -hmm. And the the third conference was not here in Notre Dame, but at the Old Globe in San Diego. And it gave a different kind of feeling because we weren't, as we're on campus for it, the Gosh Notre Dame was very strongly represented there, and many more performances about the work that was going on. I think particularly of Lisa Peterson's performance. Lisa is somebody who took a job teaching Shakespeare at something she didn't really do the research about, Riker's Academy. And it was only after she'd accepted the position that she realized it was a juvenile prison set up, and that's what she was going to be doing. And she has written a wonderful book about the whole experience of doing that. And I think, again, it's the kind of thing where people don't always walk into this work with eyes wide open, but they discover the power of that experience is about. And she did a memorable one-person performance about that whole experience. I'd really like to talk a little bit about what both Peter and Scott were just bringing up, just the bigger impact of why Shakespeare... I recall listening to This American Life's episode, I believe it was in 20, it was probably 2002, early 2000s, about a production of Hamlet at the Missouri Eastern Correction Center. And I remember at that time, that's over 20 years ago, being just incredibly moved by what performance can do, and specifically Shakespeare can do to facilitate social change and to transform lives. And I'm just curious about why this older kind of archaic text or maybe why like embodying that has this kind of impact in your own in your own opinions why is that why is it magical why does it work it's a tough question (laughs) it's a tough question because we're all also aware of the times so often across the history of shakespeare performance where and shakespeare learning when shakespeare has been an instrument of oppression not of freeing people. I think of its use by British colonial powers across the world in the British Empire to say, how can you not learn about Shakespeare to populations that we had no connection to Shakespeare? And it was never presented to them in a way that said there can be a connection. It was presented Mm -hmm. as you need to know about the right way of thinking about these things because that's what civilization is that the British Empire represents. And I say this as somebody who is proud to be British, but equally well ashamed of so much in our imperial past. There is something about Shakespeare's work that enables people to encounter other people. And it's something about the way in which Shakespeare creates characters who are so potent and so complex and so thoughtful that to try and get your head around what they, that person is that you're going to be playing is a really demanding exercise, but it's about encountering not just difficult language, but difficult language that makes up a person who thinks and speaks, who has their own relationships within the plays and so on. And I think of how that accomplishment of doing something like that resonates for many people in different areas of their lives different ages in their lives as something that they never thought they could do. Here at Notre Dame, as well as this kind of work, there is the extraordinary work done by the Robinson Shakespeare Company through the Robinson Learning Center just south of campus, run by Christy Burgess, who it so happens is married to Scott Jackson. 
And Christy works with local kids, middle schoolers, high schoolers, over and over again. They say, I never did anything that I was proud of at school. I never thought I could do anything demanding. The rest of my schoolwork was rubbish. I wasn't going anywhere. And then I got to grips with playing a Shakespeare role and I got confidence in myself and I rethought what I can achieve. And many of these kids who had no expectation of finishing high school, not only graduated high school, they'd been on to college, they've graduated college. They are people who have transformed their aims and ambitions through the extraordinary experience of encountering Shakespeare. And I think Kurt knows better than either Scott or I do how the men he works with on the Shakespeare Behind Bars program over now 30 years have spoken of how that has, it, that encounter with Shakespeare changes them, opens them up, doesn't close them down. Is that fair, Kurt? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, in speaking in the eye, is Shakespeare is the first psychologist. Uh, because I think what interested him as a human being and as an artist was human behavior. And the reason that I use theater is because the actor has to inhabit that character. And although there may be some biographical connections, as there always are to a character, a lot of the, what the character thinks and does is beyond the actor's experience, but not beyond the actor's dramatic imagination. So it's inhabiting the dramatic imagination. Like I, I, I can relate to many things about Macbeth, but not murder in playing Macbeth. What I have to do is use my dramatic imagination to, to, because I want to truthfully portray Macbeth and I have to kill someone, not as a soldier, which is, he was quite skilled at that. And it's very, something very different. And so when, if you really, again, speaking in the eye, if I really want to understand someone in life, I have to inhabit and look through their eyes, inhabit their experience and look through their eyes. And what the theater does is it allows men and women and juveniles to inhabit a character and sometimes the autobiographical stuff is quite resounding and, but more often than not, they're having to use their dramatic imagination to figure out why a character does what they do. Doing what you do is related to thinking and thinking, changing your thinking has the possibility of changing your behavior. And so it's giving them the tools through the aesthetic to really analyze themselves, to dig into their past, to unpack their past, to understand their past, because that's the only way you can move forward is understanding where you came from and why it is that you did what you did. So all of the things, the tools that an actor uses to inhabit a character are very applicable to what a human being can do to understand their own psychology, to understand their own experience. And every human being on the earth has experienced some form of trauma, some much more, and certainly with those that are incarcerated, have enormous amounts of childhood trauma, familial trauma, or societal trauma driven primarily by racism, which is the foundation of all of our social ills. And I can find in Shakespeare a character that has experienced a similar trauma to what the prisoner has experienced. And so when the prisoner chooses to play that role, what we can talk about is the character that distances from the personal in, in, in a safe way it, and allows the aesthetic to work. And Little by little, what I've observed is the deeper they dig into the character and understand the character and try to portray the character in a truthful way, it just naturally, I never really have to even bring it up, it just naturally rubs off on them and they begin to analyze their own uh, behaviors and their own thinking, which then takes them back to the trauma of their childhood. And no one is responsible for their trauma but everyone is responsible for healing their trauma 
And so this is trauma-informed work. I uh, have a, a, an essay that I wrote. I used to call it decolonizing because that was the uh, colonizing Shakespeare because that was the common. And then I really thought about that word and I thought, I don't want to use that word. What can I use? The word that I use is deharming Shakespeare because I don't think Shakespeare was meant intentionally to be harmful. He was used in colonization. He was, that's not his fault that he was used and he gets a bad rap oftentimes because of that. But I've worked in, in India and I've worked in, in, in other countries, Australia, where India in particular, part of the colonization where I've watched Indian artists perform Shakespeare brilliantly and don't have the same kind of view of Shakespeare as the enemy. Because what they come to understand is here is someone who wrote characters so authentic so deeply authentic that they, in playing that character, come to understand themselves. In understanding Shakespeare, the character, they come to understand themselves. And that's ultimately what it is. The, I, Shakespeare, I use art, theater, Shakespeare, and, the, and original writing to get at what it means to be a human being. These are all tools to use to get to helping human beings heal their trauma. A beautiful summation of your work that, that, I relate to that in my program at Westville through the lens of what I call emotional calculus, right? If calculus is the study of change, we're looking at Shakespeare's characters changing over the course of five acts. And there's something incredibly liberating, I think, for someone who is living, and you talked a lot about trauma, you're talking about a traumatized individual in a traumatizing environment that is brought into a space where they're actually given the ability to breathe, to, to lay down those defenses that, that are necessary. They're almost part of survival when you're inside. But then inhaling and exhaling these words and going on a different journey, on someone else's journey, and how that strikes some of the men that I work with to the core to the point where I've seen participants of my program who have walked away from a monologue or a scene or a whole play, as it were, even just witnessing a Shakespeare play, changed. That they're looking at their own life in a different way and feeling that much less alienated, that much less as if, as Peter said earlier, they are more than the worst thing that they've ever done in their life and recovering a certain sense of self that'll, that starts a process of reactualization, if not just actualization. I hesitate using the word rehabilitation, right? We've talked about that at great length before about that, that some folks never had that habilitation to begin with. So for me, it's about Shakespeare and the connection to breath Shakespeare and the rhythm of the verse and what happens when you open yourself up to the journey or the rye of a character and how that can surprise yourself in terms of being present and being in the room completely now that a lot of the guys never thought would be possible ever again for themselves. I think there's another aspect of all of this that, that I want to mention. And, and it's my experience of talking about this kind of work with Notre Dame students. I teach a course pretty much every year on Shakespeare and film. It's now called Shakespeare on the Big Screen, and it meets in the Browning Cinema in the Performing Arts Center on campus. And in the course of the semester, we'll have looked at a wide range of Shakespeare movies from conventional approaches to Shakespeare text to wacky productions in which not a line of Shakespeare is present. And Quite often, I use it as an opportunity also to introduce the students to Shakespeare work in prisons through either the Shakespeare documentary that Kurt mentioned earlier about his work, Shakespeare Behind Bars, or the extraordinary Italian film, Caesar Must Die, made by the Taviani brothers about a production of Julius Caesar in the prison. Or just a couple of weeks ago in that course, Johnny Stallings came in with a film of a version of Midsummer Night's Dream that he had created with 
men in a prison facility that where he has been working for many years. And I use it as an opportunity to make students aware of the nature of incarceration in the United States. This is something our students are wonderful. They are brilliant. They are caring. They are thoughtful. They are faith-driven. Everything makes them exceptional students. And they know nothing about prisons in the U.S. because it doesn't turn up on the news mark. There, there is not a vote to be had for a politician in trying to reduce the prison population. The United States ranks currently in the statistics number six in the world for the percentage of its population that is in prison. <laughs> the number per 100,000. And no, I don't believe the numbers for Russia and China and North Korea. But <laughs> the five that are ahead of us are places like Ecuador and Turkmenistan and so on. America is the first of the big countries, if you like, and the major Western countries. And it's not simply that the number of people in prison is marginally more than the number per 100,000 of population in England and Wales or in France or in Germany, but by a factor of five. And my students are shocked and appalled to discover that. Appalled by the fact that they didn't know about it. And as well as the extraordinary effect of Kurt's work and the work of all the other people we met through the Shakespeare in Prisons Network in helping the incarcerated and the post-incarcerated. I want to put the need to make more people aware, to make our students aware, people like our students aware, because for many of them, they then move on to get involved with work with the incarcerated and the post-incarcerated, to recognize that working with marginalized communities is something that, that is a passion, of a passion for them, whatever their future careers. They're, they're going to be volunteering here and there and doing service projects here and there. And they need to think about something like this, about which America just doesn't speak. And I don't mean America is exceptional in that respect. I don't hear a conversation about the prison population in the United Kingdom either. But the scale of the population, prison population in the U.S., is it is not in line just with the much larger population of the US compared with the UK. It is out of line with the rest of the world, pretty much, in percentages. And so it gives us a rare opportunity to explore something that, again, is part of our students' understanding for most of them, their Catholic identity, what it means to be part of a religion so powerfully invested in social justice concerns and the social tradition of teaching. And that's a wonderful opportunity. That's a wonderful transition, Peter, actually, to our final question, which is, where would you like to see this network go next, like in the future? It's promoted so much good in communities and individuals. Where, where next and how can people get involved? Peter mentioned students and the ways that they've been getting involved, but how can anyone listening to this get involved with network or with this type of work or with this type of initiative? The most recent iterations of the conference, kind of the trajectory we talked about in the first prisons conference that we had to shut registration at 63, right? Because we just planned like half that amount of attendees. We went into the second prisons conference and we had 107. We went into the third conference in San Diego. We had 170. And this most recent iteration, which was the fourth, which we call SIPC4, since COVID shut us down, that was staged and we affectionately referred to it as the world's longest conference because it actually ran from November of 2020 until April of 2021. And it was completely virtual, as you can imagine, during the lockdown that actually had 250 participants. And I have this demographic data here because I think this really expresses the where we're going with that, the reach of what it is we're doing. Because one of the benefits that I don't think we foresaw in that fourth Britain's conference was by going online, how much more engagement we would have from returned citizens. Because through all of these in-person conferences before, we had folks who couldn't travel over state lines. They couldn't participate that way. 
So by bringing everything online, we were actually able with these 250 participants, we had something somewhere around 27 states represented, 11 different countries, and around 50% of our sessions featured prominently a returned citizen telling their story or giving us as practitioners and researchers advice on what worked and what didn't work. And that full library is still available on the shakespeare.nd.edu website under the tab service. And that constitutes the world's largest digital archive on the subject of prison theater. I believe that's ever been created. I think we We've actually archived about 63 hours worth of panel discussions, performances, keynotes, and we did a lot of anti-racism training during that time as well. So looking at where SIPC5 would go, I think we all would like to be in the same room together, but there's going to be a hybrid element to it so that we can encourage participation from around the world without consideration of a person's status in terms of parole or their restrictions on travel, or even financially, if they can't join us at here on campus, we don't want that to be something that, that, that keeps them from participating. So SIPC5, I see broadening our cohort even more internationally, as well as promoting more participation from those those systems impacted folks who are the drivers of our work, as Kurt said, the miracles that we're watching happen in the classroom. So for me, that's where it looks like we're going, as well as research into the field, because it is a nascent field and there is a little bit of work that's being done. But in terms of, like Kurt said, the 6% recidivism that his program has demonstrated over the course of 30 years. And that's a story that we hear over and over again with practitioners around the world and the success of their programs. So bringing uh, more of a research element and interest into this and finding ways to, to bolster the field with our success stories and articulating that in metrics is a big priority, at least for myself. I don't know about the two of you. I agree with what you've been saying, Scott. I add in, if an individual is fired up by listening to this podcast and thinking, oh, what do I do now? Go to shakespeare.nd.edu and listen to some of the material from the last conference because there's many more hours there. But also, if you're just interested in finding out what's happening wherever you live, please get in touch with Scott or with me, and we will find who is doing it, prison work with Shakespeare near you and try and put you in touch with them if you want to learn more if it's practicable we can talk to groups we can uh, turn up at alumni clubs and so on who are interested in this work and introduce them further to it and watching movies is not a bad way of doing it and watching the shakespeare behind bars documentary is for many people a revelatory experience of to, to come to understand the people that we're talking about it's a documentary that, that shows us people in a particular prison at a particular time, some of whom are still in that prison in over, and have not been out of that prison over the many years since that documentary was made. And that's a powerful thought in and of itself. I urge people to watch it. It's available on DVD, probably on some streaming platform, though I'm not sure which one. In closing, I would like to thank our speakers and our listeners for joining us on this very first episode of Shakespeare and Possibility. Please tune in for future episodes, including a Valentine's Day live stream of Sonnet Fest featuring sonnet recitations from students and faculty at Notre Dame and the Sonnet Man hip-hop artist himself, Devon Glover. Also tune in for a recorded conversation from this summer's world premiere of Hamlet 5050 featuring our very own Peter Holland and the director slash co-adapter Vanessa Morosco. We'll see you then.